It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. Okay, it is uh, the next episode of Dearly Departed Podcast. Uh, I'm Mike Dorsey. I'm Scott Michaels. And this is Dearly Departed Podcast, and today uh, we are talking about uh, one of the greatest sitcoms in history, a, a groundbreaking sitcom, uh, I Love Lucy. Yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly probably the biggest, uh, 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 and, and most, like you say, groundbreaking. It, mm-hmm. uh, it really established precedent that's still uh, being used today, so, uh, so yeah, huge, hugely popular and hugely important show. Yeah, so we'll be talking about Lucy and Desi and the rest of the main cast. Uh, before we get into that, though, I want to do uh, in general news. Uh, we had two big things related to the Cecil Hotel come out this past month, and you were you were in one of them. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a, an episode of uh, Ghost Adventures, and Zach uh, had done. We both worked with Zach in the past, and this. Right. This is something that uh, they brought me in for a historic background on the hotel. So uh, the hotel basically, you know, the Cecil Hotel is notorious and mostly right. because of the, the Elisa Lamb story. But the Cecil Hotel has also had an incredible amount of terrible things happen there over the years. It's 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 bizarre and it leads people to think that it's some kind of evil portal. And it's not very often that I would say maybe they're right but there's so many terrible things that have happened there so many su- dozens of suicides murders overdoses serial killers uh just an insane amount in one small place so the cecil because american horror story hotel season with lady gaga uh was uh, based on the cecil hotel uh it's got an insane amount of publicity so they were quite uh when the hotel was still operating mostly as a hostel and also as a single room occupancy sort of you know transient hotel the hotel security were really on 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 guard for anyone that would go in there as a tourist to want to see the kind of right. deathy you know weirdo place and and for people who don't know it's downtown los angeles it's in kind of the skid row area um and it's a very large, large hotel that's like, a, it's a large hotel, it's like 100 years old. <laughs> yeah, it, it is one of the worst places uh, a hotel could be. But originally it was, it was, you know, it was built as a luxury hotel, then the stock market crash happened and it built, you know, it was, and then it turned into like a worker's hotel. And it's a lot of, um, you know, to say low income, single room occupancy, transient hotels. People have lived there for 25, 30 years, and they pay $100 a week or something like that to stay there. <laughs> right. So, um, but anyway, they, 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 they closed the hotel down because of COVID. There was a residential portion of the hotel, and they moved everybody to the second floor, and Zach and the crew got the rest of the hotel, and every room was open. So we, you know, the rooms that were able to go Amazing. where so and so jumped out the window and landed on the guy down at the sidewalk and killed them both, uh, we're able to go into that room. We were go, able to go into the Richard Ramirez room and into the room where you know Elisa Lamb uh, was staying when when she died on the roof, but the room she was staying in. And it was interesting about the Netflix documentary was that they they represented a room on the fifth floor constantly, but the room that uh, she was actually staying in at the time of her death was was on the fourth floor, but they never acknowledged that. But she was in a room mm-hmm. with a couple of people that kicked her out because she was acting right. erratically, and then they moved her to a different floor. And that was the room that she was staying in. But it was wild going through that room and just uh, going through the hotel and just going, oh, yeah, this happened there, this happened there. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was creepy. In one room in particular, there was a murder that took place in 64 of a woman they called Pigeon Goldie because she, she fed the pigeons in, in Pershing Square. Mm-hmm. And blocks away and being in that room i'm not one to get affected in fact you were with me the other time i was affected uh literally like i got to get out of here and that was the wonderland house uh mm. when we were on the top floor and i was sitting wherever that person was was murdered and uh, uh but it was like i you know I, this is bad i gotta get out but there was so much going on in this house that the neighbors heard screaming i just figured oh it's the drug dealers again but it is amazing that those those things happen, and it's such a quiet area, and there's houses literally five feet this way and five feet the other way. And nobody called the cops. 
And uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't I know if that's psychic. I don't know what that is, but it was something that I felt very uncomfortable with. I mean, the hairs, everything, and I've never reacted that way before, even there. So um, so yeah, that was something that was wild. And and then uh, I wasn't in on the Elisa Lam uh, uh, investigation when Zach got and those guys did it. But when we, after we were done with my part, he had one of the producers take me up to the roof, and I was able mm -hmm. to walk around up there to see the water tower where she where she drowned. Wow. That was wild. It was nighttime, so the the, the view was spectacular mm. from, you know, 15 stories up. Everything looks good. <laughs> and, right, uh, right, and, uh, right, walking right. up to the water tower where she was uh, where she was found was was pretty chilling. It was a, it was a really interesting uh, experience. And so people who don't know, Elisa Lam was a, a Canadian tourist from, I think, the Vancouver area. And she um, came here kind of, she was 21, and she came here on kind of just a trip on her own uh, around California. She went down to San Diego, and then she came up to L.A. and checked into a hotel that she may not have realized was in a rough, as rough of an area as it was. Uh, if you don't know L.A., you, don't, you may not know any better. And then just mysteriously disappeared and was found, I believe, 19 days later in one of the water tanks up on top of the roof. Uh, floating naked she had taken her clothes off um and eventually was ruled accidental she had a history of psychological problems uh bipolar disorder she was on medication they determined that she had stopped probably stopped taking her medication uh, her family said she had a history of irrational behavior like this she was kicked out of that room because she was leaving weird notes on the the, the bunk beds of the other girls that she was rooming with and they complained about it she was leaving notes like telling them to go go home get out go away um just very strange and uh, so they think that she just ultimately had a, a mental breakdown. But there was a very weird video of her on the, the elevator that went super viral all around the world um, of her acting very strange. And people thought that it was uh, uh, that she was being haunted because she looked like she was talking to someone who wasn't there. Um, and other people thought that she had been murdered. Um, so they, it, it was it's it, it, it got a lot of coverage. And then um, this multi-part documentary series on Netflix kind of tackled the whole thing. Um, and you, you saw that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, I was, uh, I my was friend, honest with you, I wasn't a big fan of this documentary. I thought I was going to be, mm -hmm. but I, yeah. I, they could have done it in in half the time. Yeah, and they could. I mean, their talking heads were all YouTube sleuths. A lot of them were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have wanted to talk to detectives, her family, yeah. uh, you know, things like that. But it was all. It was. Yeah. It was YouTube they sleuths. Yeah, they had um, Tim Marcia, who was the uh, or Marcia, the, the detective. He's a senior detective in LAPD, who was the detective on the case uh, for robbery homicide division. But he, they didn't use him as much as I think they should have. Uh, and and then my friend Greg Kading, who I made murder rap with, he they brought him in as an expert. He's a retired homicide detective. They came in. He kind of almost was like a, a, a unofficial narrator. He kind of just gave you the facts of the story as it as it happened. Um, but yeah, they did a lot of the the internet stuff, and I I'm very um, I'm a very skeptical person. I don't cater to conspiracy nut stuff. So I did get annoyed a few times by how much time they spent on all that stuff. But then I had to keep reminding myself that that was also part of the story because I do remember following it closely at the time. And that kind of became part of the story was all the all the people with their crazy theories. Um, but I feel like it, it was a little exploitational. On, on yeah, that, I mean, they, they gave know? a lot of time to that uh, that death metal guy. <laughs> Morbid, I think his name yeah, was. Yeah, and they were talking about how you know he he, he had a song that, that kind of mirrored the events, and then you know he was he was behind it. But I, you know, and this is, I was looking at the YouTube clip of his, and it was like ninety seven views. You know, I was like, I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying they're they're making it sound like this guy made a living off of this, and it was right. one weird you know coincidence, and uh, and also was worthy of noting is that the only footage they had of the interior of the hotel was cell phone footage. They had no, they, they got no rights to film in the hotel. 95% of that documentary was drone shots on the yeah. exterior. And the stuff that they used of the interior was all off people's, you know, phones. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, again, it could have been done in half the time. And uh, I think they, you know, okay. Okay. I think the moment the moment that they said that if you push that open door button and it stayed open for two minutes, that was like right. That solves the question because that was the only watching. And I was like, oh, wow, that is weird that the door wouldn't close. And I couldn't remember that when it first came out. But then and then also the way that they saved until the very we're spoiling things. Sorry for people. If you've already if you haven't watched this yet and you wanted to turn this off and go watch it now. But the other big thing that they that they didn't that they didn't that they kept from you was the lid. 
and how the maintenance guy that found her body said that when he discovered it, the lid was open. And all up to that point, they made you believe the lid had been closed. And they're like, how could she have closed the lid from inside the tank? And then it comes out, oh, it wasn't. And again, if they had just said, you push that button, the doors stay open for two minutes, and the lid was open, that movie would have been over in like 20 minutes. Yeah, that <laughs> that would have been like case closed. Thing, for people that don't know, the shocking thing was that she was in that water tower for 19 days, dead. Well, they yeah. don't know for how long, but clearly for very they assume, long. Yeah. And people in the hotel were noticing that the water pressure was down and that it was an odd color. And some people complained that it smelled or tasted bad because they're yeah. brushing their teeth and taking showers in Gross. this, in this, in this, this, you know, yeah. woman water. And that, that's what made it even more shocking. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of theories about her clothes being taken off. Uh, as I understand it, if you if you're if you have hypothermia, you you feel differently. I, and right. I've done that before, where I've been you know I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up where it was freezing, and I felt you know my hands were literally frozen, and they felt hot. So right. uh, you know you want to you want to. I'm guessing I wasn't there, but I, everything that happened to her is easily explainable now. Yeah. But, right. uh, you know, she was kicked out of that game show taping the day before because she was acting. Yeah, she, she wrote a letter to the host. It was very weird. And they were like, whoa, she's a she's a security threat. <laughs> we need to get her out of here. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's all um, easily explained with all the components in place. We were never given them all. So yeah. that that is important, uh, you know. But again, it could have been done in half the time. <laughs> What, and look, I, I, I'm not a detective, and I've spent a lot of time trying to solve other th- crimes for shows and movies that I've done, so I, I, I'm somewhat of an internet sleuth also. But we need to realize that the general public is not given all the information for a reason, and it's at the end of the day, it's not our business. We're not the ones being paid to solve these crimes. The detectives are. And so they, they withhold information sometimes for a specific reason because they don't want – a, they don't want whoever, the, if it is foul play, they don't want the person to know that they're onto them. Or they just want to re- withhold details so that if someone comes forward with information that they know they haven't released to the public, then they know that it's a credible person that, that, they, should, that they can listen to. You know, So there's just, it's important. Well, why didn't the detectives tell us this? Because it's none of your damn business. Right. It's their business. They're trying How to solve crime. Not, you know, these not, people yeah. should be fired. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> right. It's like they, their job is not to please the public. Their job yeah. is to solve crimes. So they'll tell the public if they think it'll help the crime, if they don't help them solve it. If they don't think it will, they won't tell you. So... I get it. Uh, also, I talked to our um, – I, I messaged our friend Craig Harvey, the former uh, corner director of operations here in L.A., about just the Cecil in general. And he said that um, at the Cecil and other hotels like the Cecil, he said it was not uncommon for them to report for one you know person that was dead in a hotel room. And as he's walking down the hall to see the, you know, the tape residue from the coroner's tape from other <laughs> times that they'd been there in the past, he said, you'd see what's cause very similar when they were talking in the show about someone died in that room and someone killed themselves in that room and a murder happened there. And there was an overdose over here. It was like, you know, you have a 700 room hotel that's, you know, a century old and a rough part of town. Yeah. A lot of bad stuff's going to happen there over the years. Yeah, I love that they had that manager who said, is there any room where someone hasn't died in this place? I really liked her, too. I liked her. I I, I thought she was real. She was cool. Um, But, yeah, the show's gotten a lot of criticism because of all the the conspiracy stuff. Oh, that that, that scene where they showed – yeah, because it was easy for her to get on the roof, easy, uh, through the security door, which I – 100% 100% positive the alarm wasn't on. And, uh, and, they, and, all, and they showed other people going up there with their with their cell phone cameras, and it wouldn't set it off. So. Well, when they showed, they, you know, they said, or she could have taken the fire escape. And when they showed that footage of the fire escape, I almost lost my mind. I mean, <laughs> the fire escape, you know, it's zigzag, 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 and then you get to the last floor, and it's a straight-up ladder to the roof. And there has to be 20 oh, feet there, no. nothing around you. And, and I just watched it. you're 150 it. feet up in the air. My knees were given out just watching, and I could not stop looking at it. It was like, <laughs> it was terrifying, uh, you know? And I, I can't imagine, I think if I was in that hotel and there was a fire, I would seriously look at that going, I can't do this. You know, I yeah. would have probably done it, but I would have been so absolutely, I would have frozen. I would have absolutely right. frozen on that ladder. I wouldn't have been able to move. And, uh, right. oh, it's so terrifying. So terrifying. So the ghost adventures thing you did is on, I think it's on discovery plus yeah. the, the discovery's new streaming service. And the, uh, the Netflix one is called crime scene, the vanishing at the Cecil hotel. And that one's specifically about the Elisa lamb story. So if you feel so inclined, uh, I was entertained by both. 
Mm-hmm. So check it out. So you had one more bit of uh, news? Yeah, we we last week, as Troy and I loaded up our last uh, van load of things from Hollywood, as we're in the car leaving Los Angeles, I got the news alert that Burt Reynolds was moved to Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Uh, so now our my, my my neighbor is not Burt. Well, my forever neighbor is because I have a, a plot <laughs> there. But uh, but yeah, Burt Reynolds after three years uh, of, of being dead almost. Uh, was in Florida, and I guess was un, you know somebody had his urn uh, this week was was buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery over on Santa Monica Boulevard across from our old shop. That's great. We, we got another one. That's awesome. We got another good one. They're digging That's him really up cool. and bringing him. I mean, Judy Garland, she wasn't even around. You know, forty seven years in New York, <clears> they took <throat> her up and brought her over. So, yeah, it's uh, it's some prime real estate over there. Yeah. That wraps up our current events uh, updates. Um, and I think we're going to skip hate mail because we don't have any. No, it's all love mail. No, I mean, I'm tired of the, I, you know, you look like Uncle Faster stuff. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay, I know. There's nothing original. So, <laughs> oh, speaking of that, uh, um, they are doing, uh, I just sent this to you, uh, to just announce Tim Burton is going to do an Adam's Family spinoff series. On Wednesday, Adams, when she, uh, her at school, is the the basis for it, um, and it's the first live action television series that um, Tim Burton has ever done, and I believe it's for Netflix. There was a big bidding war among all the streamers for it, and they got it. So, just announced like hours before uh, we recorded this. Interesting. Yeah, that will be very interesting. I um, yeah, I like the uh, the movies are great. You know, Christina Ricci. Mm-hmm. Yeah top her it really would and uh, it really would be hard to to get somebody like now Kristen stewart or something (laughs) i mean it would just be like well it's probably too old i'm supposed to be her school age so i don't know if that means kid or teenager or college i I couldn't i couldn't figure out from what i was reading but it'll have to be i think someone in their teens or or early 20s would be my guess i just hope they don't make her gothy that's all because you know wednesday it was dark but she wasn't gothy yeah and so I hope that they don't uh, they don't do that. But who knows? I mean, I, I I was kind of nervous about the Adams Family movies when they made them, and I love them. So uh, yeah. So you yeah. know, the second effect, the original. <laughs> it's time for the main feature. Um, All right, so uh, from that segue, uh, old TV shows to an even older TV show. I Love Lucy, starring uh, Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz, William Frawley, and Vivian Vance. Um, A groundbreaking, as we mentioned at the top, uh, television sitcom uh, that started in 1951 and ran for six years. And um, it was the pioneered sitcom filming techniques. I think it was the first or one of the first multi-cam sitcoms shot in front of a live audience uh they um did a thing where they um they built the sets next to each other which i don't think had been done before so they could easily switch from one set to the other one um and and i think some other, there were some other things about it that were very cutting edge for their time yeah three um, cameras that was the first time that was actually used mm-hmm. and it was because it was all done like a play before you know it was one one right. set one camera and uh, recently, I don't know how long ago this footage came out, but you know, at the beginning when they taped or when they filmed "I Love Lucy," Desi would come out and talk to the audience and then introduce everyone, and they all their robes on, their makeup, you know, et cetera. <laughs> and uh, and I had him talking to the audience and said, "We when we do this thing, you know, it's three cameras, and don't worry, it'll never obstruct your view. You know, watch. We'll give you an example." And it showed like all cameras <laughs> on, you know, right in front of him, and nobody <laughs> could see anything. But it was a way of of introducing that and making it funny instead of annoying for the audience uh, when, when it actually did happen for the close-ups and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it was hugely popular because they, you know, the, the studio wouldn't back it because it was, uh, you know, an interracial marriage and, uh, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't have anything to do with it. And, they, and, and Lucy and Desi felt so strongly about it, they, they, they put their own money up for it and good on them because they didn't sure expect yeah. it to be a hit. And uh, they, they rolled the dice big time to make that pilot. And uh, and yeah, not only interracial, but Desi was you know he he had the thick accent. He was kind of hard to understand. The kind of broken English, and they were afraid that audiences wouldn't go along with it or if they wouldn't understand him. Uh, and the studio was totally wrong. <laughs> happily for for the rest of us. 
Yeah, yeah, that was it. Was something. <laughs> it was funny. I know. I talked to some people that I know that are, that are uh, you know Latin in s in descent, and said that when he would he would go off and start you know talking in Spanish and screaming, and they were like their eyes would light up. It's like oh my god, there's somebody speaking Spanish on television, <laughs> and uh, right. they never, never had that before. So it was kind of uh, fascinating. She was also uh, the first actress to um, have a real life pregnancy on television. Uh, she was pregnant in real life on the show. I, I, we're going to stay talking about Lucy till later, but um, that's just another kind of groundbreaking episode. And then when her character had the baby, that was the highest rated episode of the show's history. So Vivian Vance played Ethel Mertz. Uh, she was the, um, notable. Also, she was the first actress to ever win the Emmy for Outstanding Supporting Actress, which was a new award that they added in 1954. And she was the original winner of that. Uh, of that Emmy. Um, and famously, uh, her and uh, William Frawley, who played her husband, hated each other. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, they were both pretty uh, headstrong people. And, and I think I think that they were the Mertzes were supposed to be, you know, significantly older than Lucille and, and Desi or Ricky in the show. So mm -hmm. they, they gave them really dowdy clothes to wear. And I don't think that Vivian Vance and Lucy were actually that different in age, but she really had mm -hmm. to had to dull it down. You know, I, there's stories. I mean, Lucy, we can go in, we'll go into it a little bit more about her, what a perfectionist she was. And she was very, uh, she was a professional. She was, there was, you know, don't veer from the script, don't ad lib, and this is what you do. And, and the story is that Vivian Vance was wearing eyelashes, and Lucy literally took them off her. I doubt that happened, but said, nobody wears eyelashes right. in the show but me. And uh, so right. she, she knew the story, she knew what made it, and uh, and she was Lucy. So, you know, what she said went. But uh, But I think Vivian Vance had a hard time being, you know, sort of shoved to the sidelines, but it was all about Lucy. And Mertz, uh, she also you know, was grateful for work. <laughs> and she, and with the age thing, she resented that Frawley was, I think, twenty-two years older than her, and she's you know, supposed to be her husband. So it just it made her look. He, any actor or actress is sensitive about their age and how they are presented, and so she's being presented as being you know twenty years older than she is in real life, and she feels co like she's competing with the main star of the of the show. Yeah, it's a tough situation. Um, but they 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 were professionals. They and supposedly they got along more you know as time went on. Her and Lucille Ball um, and got to know each other. And then and then Lucy um, commented years later. It may have even been after. Um, Vance has pa passed away, but she said that um, Lucy was so wrapped up, Lucy and Desi were so wrapped up in producing the show also, they were so busy um, uh, that she, she said that she never really sat back and watched what Vance was doing until she got to watch the reruns years later and then she said she, just, she got a whole new level of respect, um, getting to just sit back and watch her as an audience member at what she was able to do on screen so I thought that was interesting too Yeah, they were, I, it's funny they Marin County, where she lived, is not that far away. And it seemed like she and, you know, Lucy and, and, and Vivian were friends. You know, they hadn't seen each other for years. It's only, you know, it's only right up the road, really. And uh, right. I never really understood stood that. But uh, I watched the other night the Dean Martin roast uh, of Lucy. and Oh, great. I, what they got away with on that show is, oh, my God. You know, I was watching it. I'm surprised they even show it because some of that stuff is like, really really literally racy i mean there, yes. there's um, there's some really i mean dean martin whoever said you know dean martin's acting drunk is lying dean martin can't even stand up during this show he is slurring right. he's, you know his glass his drink is going everywhere <laughs> and he can't barely even read the cue cards that he's supposed to be reading but uh but it was vivian vance does a little a little to Lucy or a little roast of Lucy and she she I think there was some resentment in there because Lucy and 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 Desi owned the show and right. uh, they, they were literally the owners of the show and she said you know I, I I think of my my years on I love Lucy as the biggest ripoff of my life and I'm sure that there was an element of edge to it and I'm mm -hmm. sure she was joking it was a roast anyway but I, right. I have a feeling that she really genuinely felt that um you know she should have got a piece of the action but and 
she did come back. She came back in the 60s for Lucy's new show as a different character uh, and played a, a divorced uh, divorced uh, mother, a single mother, which I think was also the first time that a divorcee was presented in a major primetime series um, like that, like that she was. But uh, she had stipulations that she didn't want to wear the frumpy clothes anymore. anymore. She wanted to wear nice uh, outfits, and they were, she kind of threw her weight around a little bit more when she came back uh, for the new series. So, yeah. She was an op- she was a soprano, like an accomplished soprano. And mm. uh, and she and uh, Lucy and Desi saw her performing, I think it was La Jolla, on stage and, and got to meet her and, and liked her so much. The um, there's a story that I read before all the books came out. There was one book called Lucy, Ricky, Fred, and Ethel: The Story of I Love Lucy, and this was published back in the probably early '80s. And there's one story that uh, you know there was always a story. I don't think it's true that Vivian Vance was contractually obligated to be to stay 20 pounds heavier than Lucy. I don't think that's true, yeah. but it's been it's been one of those rumors. Mm. But this is a story, and it's a good story, and because um, there was obviously tension on the set because Lucy was a you know she was. You know, you, you got to do it my way, and there's no room for anything else. No movement. Yeah. And I, as I understand it, when when she was pregnant, when Lucille Ball was pregnant, they moved her dressing room closer to the stage, and put you know Vivian Vance back in Lucy's dressing room, mm-hmm. which was way far away. And there was a moment when uh, Lucille Ball was on stage, and the call time was X, and Vivian Vance was, you know, going through everything and used to the timing of her own dressing room and walking right. over cables and everything to uh, to get to this to the set. And uh, and then when she got there, Lucy said, "You're late." And her her supposed response was, "I tell you to go fuck yourself," but Desi's already done that. <laughs> you know, it's just it's well, kind of, fun. <laughs> but it had to have been well, hard work to be part of to be you know Lucy's. You're there, and that's where you're going to stay, kind of right. character. But Lucy knew the chemistry; she knew how it was going to work, and that's that was the agreement. It's just that she was very serious about it. There wasn't a lot of room for wiggle. Yep. And she died what of cancer? Uh, what is it? Bone, Bone cancer, cancer, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and she said, I guess when when she got hired to be uh, when she got hired as the part of uh, Vivian Vance, there was tension again. But she said, it, uh, upon upon getting the part, she said, I'm going to learn to love that bitch. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> and she did. That's funny. And she did. And I th- and I think by then she had moved to the East Coast, so she was going back and forth uh, from her house in the East Coast to to shoot in L.A. And that was also causing strain by that for the, the the new series that was done in the '60s, that also caused strain. So she she kind of as the seasons wore on on that show, she was in fewer and fewer episodes um, until they had kind of a falling out over a, a disagreement that really was more a miscommunication between their agents, I think, over that. And it basically got communicated to Lucille Ball that Vivian basically wanted to be her equal on the show, but that's not what she was asking for. She just wanted a little bit more power i guess and and for for what she was going through to be able to still do the show uh and they had a falling out over it and then eventually they reconciled late years later and she started doing guest appearances on it again but yeah just anytime i've been in this situation myself especially in this business you have big personalities and their heads butt it just happens yeah, but you know, but also, and understandably so, because actors are, you know, uh, there's well, there's with any project like this, if it's high profile, there's there's ego involved, and if you're renegotiating mm-hmm. something else, you're like, ah, it's not going to happen anymore. You know, we're going to do things differently this time. I should get a piece of it, and right. I, and I, I get that too. If you're going to renegotiate a whole new thing or negotiate a whole a whole new project, then you know, and you know your worth this time before right. you were. So you, but now you do, uh, and you're like, look, you know, I bit my I bit my tongue for years because I was locked into a contract, and I I know what I agreed to. But now that I get to set reset things, I don't want to do it this way anymore. So yeah, I get it. And I guess when when Lucy and Mary Wicks, who was one of those actresses who showed up in I Love Lucy many times, most people nowadays know her. She was the nun and sister act, sister Mary Clarence or something like the big one with the nose. You know, she yeah. Been, thousand uh episodes of every show and uh yeah, she and mary wicks went to uh visit vivian vance one last time uh when she was on her literally on her deathbed back in 1979 and said that uh i guess viv was out of it but when she walked in uh her eyes lit up and and oh. and uh 
and they hugged and kissed and professed their love for each other. And then Mary Wick said that Lucy cried the entire way home. Uh, so Aww. there you are. But uh, but yeah, rest in peace, Vivian Vance, Vivian Bagley on the on the Lucy show. Ethel Mertz, Ethel May Potter. We never forgot her. <laughs> um, so to her her uh, her screen husband William Frawley, uh, who played Fred Mertz. He had a real problem with uh, with drink, and and as I understand it, when they signed the contract, he asked Desi Arnaz asked him to be on the show. Uh, he said, "If you ever miss work, you ever show up late because of your drinking, yeah, uh, you know, you're out." And also, but right. he had, also had it in his contract that he would be able to uh, have days off in the Dodger games when the Dodgers played. Uh. Uh, he would uh, he would be able to take those days off. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he had a real drinking problem. You could see it on the show quite often where you look at him, you can see he had the shakes in a big way. And, huh. uh, and uh, that's, that's quite obvious at times that uh, he had a problem when he died. He was, li- well, he was living at the El Royale over on Vine street, uh, just past uh, May West's place. And, oh, uh, interesting. It, and kind of uh, at Ross where Rossmore kind of becomes. Yeah. Rossmore yeah. Vine. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's where, like, Peter Dinklage lives in there, and Hill Hauser lived in there, and, and oh, uh, okay. Draft lived in there, and Nicholas Cage lived in there. And so it's a really, <sighs> it's a high-end place, but Frawley was living there. But when Frawley died on Hollywood Boulevard, they dragged him into the Knickerbocker Hotel lobby, uh, where he was pronounced dead. And he lived in the Knickerbocker for many years, but he moved out. So it's just kind of interesting that so- he ended up there. So he died on March 3rd, 1966. He was 79 of a heart attack. And he he was out on the street near the Knickerbocker and they took him into the lobby. Is that? Yeah, he was. He saw a movie uh, at the Vine Street Theater and he was with his male nurse. For some reason, they, they mentioned that all the time, a male nurse. <laughs> but he'd been ill for a while and supposedly required a full time male nurse. Yet he still could walk to the bus stop and take the bus from the movie theater. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so but he they say that he was walking to the bus stop and he and he dropped out of a heart attack and uh they dragged him into the Knickerbocker and tried to resuscitate him. Paramedics showed up and it was unsuccessful. They actually took him to the Hollywood Receiving Hospital, which is on uh, Wilcox at Fountain, which is now a police station. But that's where the, the old hospital was. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and that's where he was. Uh, he was pronounced of myocardial myocardial insufficiency, basically just a heart attack, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, and yeah. And he when when he died, uh, and apparently this is something I didn't know. But jumping back to when he was hired, I heard that Lucy originally wanted Gail Gordon to be that part. Uh, who ended up being Mr. Mooney and, and every other mm-hmm. Lucy incarnation. Gail <laughs> Gordon is always in it. But Gail Gordon couldn't do I Love Lucy, and that's why they got Frawley, uh, which is just an interesting aside. But um, but when he died, uh, Desi Arnaz took out a, a full-page ad in, in The Hollywood Reporter uh, and said, uh, Buenas noches, amigo, on it, which I thought uh, was cool. And Desi was supposedly a, um, a pallbearer at the funeral. Him, Interesting. He was at the Callanan Mortuary, which is the same people that did Ed Wood and Battle Lugosi over on oh, uh, Boulevard by the Pantages and Peg Antwistle that jumped off the Hollywood mm-hmm. sign. Uh, they were all done at the Callanan, Callanan Mortuary, and he's buried up at San Fernando Mission Cemetery, uh, 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 a little bit north of Los Angeles. So in, in his last cameo, I don't know if you, you saw that the Lucy show, where uh, he's in it, actually, where he plays a horse trainer. And they're walking through a stable, and they talk they, a couple of lines, and then she says, you look kind of familiar. And then mm-hmm. goes on. That was, I guess, Frawley's last appearance was uh, oh, wow. that. So it's just kind of a, a cool little uh, nod, uh, acknowledgement, giving the fans mm-hmm. something, because it's a real sentimental thing, and Frawley probably wasn't the easiest person to get along with. So it was nice for the fans to see that one last time. Rest in peace, William Frawley. So, uh, Ricky Ricardo was Lucio Ball's husband in real life, Desi Arnaz. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I read that I thought was interesting or funny was that they uh, they would crack each other up a lot 
you know, doing the scenes. Of course, they were professionals, so they normally wouldn't break, but sometimes they would. And you can reportedly see this in the show sometimes, certain episodes, you can see them kind of break a little bit. And you can also hear the scenes where Lucy, where Desi isn't on, on screen, but Lucille is. You can see, uh, you can sometimes hear him laugh wow. off camera yeah. at what he's seeing because he, she, what she, her antics were so hilarious, he, he couldn't keep it in, you know, <laughs> which I think is awesome. <laughs> Yeah. I've done that on some of my documentaries. I've done that myself. I know a few areas where I can hear myself laugh, and I know only I know, but I can I hear I hear a little laugh come out of me. Yeah, <laughs> now, he he was a little bit more of a free spirit than than Lucille Ball was, and that, that was mm-hmm. his downfall too. But right. uh, but you 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 know they were they were really serious business people, serious business people. Oh, by owning the show, they gave them a, they got they got a chance to own a studio. And Lucy, right. you know, was able to head his studio after they divorced. So, you know, it was yeah. changing the way television was made, how how situation comedies were made. I mean, they were they were really important business people in Hollywood, and and at a time when, you know, just be nice and do your show. You know, it's right. Like they, they bought a studio. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Lucille Ball was the first woman to head a TV production company, and after they divorced, she bought out his share of it and and had it all for herself. Yeah, and together, I mean, they they also produced the Untouchables series. Star Trek is because of them. Um, the Mission Impossible TV series. And one of our uh, Patreon supporters, I'm going to do a little plug here, um, Sarah uh, recommended on Patreon that we do a Mission Impossible TV show episode one of these days. So maybe it was that, that's probably something we'll do also. Um, but a lot of people don't re- may not realize that that... Uh, that they it wasn't just the, the shows that they were in they were responsible for some pretty big uh series and uh other projects with their company yeah, which I mean, uh, eventually was folded into paramount there would be no she went to bat for star trek you right. know what i mean they were, they were like a science fiction tv show are you nuts lucy went yep. no nah, we're gonna do this so she was she went to bat for it that was lucy is responsible for star trek i love that yep so uh, after Desi had his own demons, um, he was uh, uh, they nearly got divorced in 1944. Uh, lucky for TV fans, they didn't go through with it, um, but they did eventually divorce in 1960. And uh, Lucy, Lucille Ball described being married to Arnez as a nightmare um, that you know he would disappear for days at a time and she would become a recluse because uh, she didn't want to go out and have to face like where's Desi questions you know and he was you know she was always convinced that he was fooling around which very well may have been if he's disappearing (laughs) um but then after they got divorced they stayed good friends uh they were good as friends but not good as married couple they were i mean she when they were i mean it was to say it was rocky is is a a, an understatement i mean she took a hammer to his head once you know she threw a hammer oh wow uh, you know, because, you know, because that story about him being unfaithful to her. And he and he said later on, he goes, well, these people, these women were hookers. They didn't mean anything. She's the one I love. But oh. they would get into fights and then he'd get drunk and then he'd go, you know, do his thing. And um, but she when it got out one time, it was in the Hollywood uh, Confidential, the, this womanizing. And she threw a hammer at his head and hit him. And uh, and he was knocked out. And then they, they worked it in that, that he had uh, fallen and hit a ladder or something like that. But wow. uh, it could not have been easy to be uh, to be Mr. Lucy, and that was what he was always going to be. Never mind the fact that he was this intelligent uh, uh, businessman who made these smart decisions. But he was always going to be Mr. Lucy, and um, and he uh, and he never felt he never. In fact, at his um, when she was being she he died. When uh, the day or two before Lucy was going to get the Kennedy Center on her. And he said that uh, uh, he said his quote, because when he died, it was Lucy got the award a couple of days later. So Robert Stack read something that, that Desi wrote for Lucy. And she said, Lucy was the show. Viv, Fred and I. He's called him Fred, too, not William. But he said, uh, Lucy was the show. Viv, Fred and I were just props. And I love Lucy was never just a title. And I thought that was, uh, he was, he never took that away from her. He was, he was a disaster as a human being personally, you know, being that, you know, booze and and it was clear at the end of it that, that, you know, you could look at him and see what the toll it took on his body. Uh, You know, later on, he produced the TV show called The Mother's-in-Law with Eve Arden and uh, Kay Ballard 
And then their husbands, um, I don't know, two gay actors that could not be more gay. And then one of them quit, and then Richard Deacon, the other gay actor, took over. But, uh, but And Desi showed up on one or two of those episodes. But he, exact, he was the producer of The Mothers-in-Law, which was another fun sort of 60s, early 70s uh, TV show that, that, that Desi showed up on. But, uh, but after that, he sort of he just went into the, to the background. He got married again. He was living in uh, Del Mar with his wife, yep. Edie. Right on the beach. Yeah, beautiful house. Beautiful house. Yeah, really cool little beach house in Del Mar, yeah. And he was into horse racing, uh, and uh, Del Mar uh, racetrack has, uh, the I think, the Desi Arnaz stakes kind of in his honor. Um, I don't know if that's still happening, but they did have it. And he was big into horse racing, and he, uh, he bred ho- uh, racehorses. And uh, that was, he kind of semi-retired, I think, after to some extent he did he still did some projects but never at the level that lucy went on to do in the 60s and beyond and then um you know i think to lucy's lucille ball's uh you know personal detriment even though he was horrible he was horrible to be married to uh she was you know in love with him and after they divorced she remarried uh she married a producer named gary morton and i think after lucy died gary morton said something to the effect of uh you know lucy's finally has what she wanted she's together with desi again Mm. So I think that's what the world. Clear that you, yeah, they could never. Right. I mean, she. I think that you know, there's always that one love that you'll never get over. I think, and and something so sure. public that that they were, you know, people loved them so much together. Um, that that was a real when they were divorcing. That was a big deal. That was really scandalous. It was like when Sonny and Cher were divorced. You know, uh, although their show was over with "I Love Lucy." Uh, it was it was really scandalous back then, and you could never meet Lucy without saying, "Where's Ricky?" And and since they were married in real life, it had to have been hard to be Gary Morton because he was even a worse mystery. <laughs> in fact, in Warhol's diaries, Andy Warhol, he saw Gary Morton showed up at Studio Fifty Four, and uh, and uh, somebody he wasn't gonna they weren't gonna let him in. And Andy said, "You gotta let him in. That's Mr. Lucy." <laughs> you know? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, and you're still and and he's living in they're still living in the house which we'll talk about in a bit they're still living in the house in Beverly Hills that Lucy and Desi lived in yeah. so you're not only married to this guy's ex-wife but you're living in their house that's got to be weird that's got to be a weird and she's clearly still hung up on him yeah yeah that and and as i understand it she visited him you know in his last days and and uh and and somebody i don't know if this is true or not but somebody told me that he she moved him into the house on Roxbury Drive at the end, uh, so she could sort of look over his uh, after his because he because re, he remarried and his ex his new wife then passed away. Someone wrote to you on your find a death page and said had said that they heard that, that after his second wife died he briefly moved, or something like that he briefly moved into the guest house and how you know Gary Morton must have loved that <laughs> if that happened you know yeah. but Lucy had those two kids with 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 Desi Arnaz so. Uh, yeah. You know, they had a, they, they, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, those kids on their own are a story, man. They, they, they are, mm-hmm. man, you know, they're, they're something. It's weird. And, and that, I, because everyone wants to think that Lucy is this uh, smiling, laughing, clowning lady, but she was a really serious, competitive uh, uh, lady. She, she was no holds barred. She said that she, you know, her kids could talk to her about anything, but, I don't think so. I don't I <laughs> right. think she hope that, but I don't right. think that she was that way because there's all sorts of stories about her kids sort of rebelling and uh, and having real issues with with uh, well, with her. Look, because- Hollywood is full of stories about the kids of famous people growing up messed up because they grew up in the shadow. And they also grew up with all oftentimes absentee parents who are busy with their demanding schedules and aren't around to raise them. And it's just you end up with the lots of messed up celebrity kids as a result of that. And Desi Jr. grew up to be, uh, you know, he turned into a teen heartthrob in the 70s and dated some uh, famous people. I think he dated Liza Minnelli for a time. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I, I read that Lucy um, commented on that, that she uh, after they after he broke up with her and moved on to someone else, Lucy said something about how she missed uh, Liza, but Liza could not be domesticated <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> That's funny. Well, there was, you know, she wanted her kids to grow up and to be professionals on their own. But then Desi Jr. was in the band, Dino, Desi and Billy and got huge. She goes, well, there's that, you know, all of a sudden he's a pop star with his own money. 
but yeah. uh, he was dating Patty Duke for a while. That's and Patty right. Duke and he, uh, Lucy did not approve. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know, maybe it was at the peak of Patty Duke's substance abuse or something. But also, Desi was not 18 yet. He was only, he was only uh, 17. Mm-hmm. And they wanted, she wanted him done. So she really forced them to break up, and she was gonna. She she threatened to, to Patty Duke that she was gonna uh, get her for statutory rape since Desi was only seventeen years old. Now the rumor is that you know very shortly afterwards Patty Duke became pregnant, and she became pregnant with Sean Astin, who is now Sean mm. Astin. And if you look at Sean Astin and you put his face next to Desi Arnaz Jr., it's like. Okay, now Desi Arnaz Jr. has dark features, you know, he's dark eyes, dark hair, and Sean Astin is more fair-haired, but so was Patty Duke. But if you put them side to side, there's always been this rumor that Sean Astin is actually Desi Arnaz uh, uh, Jr.'s son. And later on, it came out, they said that Sean Astin said it was actually a rock and roll um, Yeah. Uh, producer that was his father or something like that but yeah it's like it's like ronan farrow you know you look at him and put him up to next to sinatra's picture and it's like and it's like you're looking at really? a mirror image almost <laughs> yeah. yeah so i know right. I, you know, I mean legally you know maybe they i but i i if you hold up sean astin's picture patty duke's mm. son which works out timeline wise to desi arnaz jr and uh yeah but lucy did not approve did not approve and it's kind of ironic because um, I, when I was skimming her Wikipedia page, so I take I take this to be true that um, Lucy herself, when she was fourteen, uh, uh, started dating a twenty-one year old, uh, quote unquote, hoodlum. Uh, I was only a fourteen year old dating a twenty one year old, and Lucy's mother did not approve, and that's why Lucy got into acting. Her mom, even though they had limited funds, um, got Lucy into an acting school. Uh, to try and get her, because she knew that Lucy was interested in entertainment, just to try to lure her away from this guy that she was, this older guy that she was dating, and and it worked, and that's how Lucy became an actress. So it's kind of ironic, uh, and uh, that that she then ended up having the same issue with her own kid. <laughs> yeah. Over over that. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Graffiti itself, yeah. Uh, so Desi Arnaz passed away on uh, December second, nineteen eighty six. He was sixty nine from lung cancer, and I mean he just uh, li- lived hard, uh, smoked a lot. Smoked cigars, I think, a lot, and uh, and it, it caught up with him, I guess. Sure did. Yeah. So Lucy, Lucy, and and Desi Arnaz, you know, took the profit to my love, Lucy. They they filmed it for two years at um, at uh, the Los Pal- I don't know what they call it now, but it was Los Palmas and and uh, and Santa Monica Boulevard, that studio. And then they took the profit to my love. No, they, then they moved over to Red Studios. They went on mm-hmm. Coenga, and that's yeah. where they were. In fact, there's that there's that picture of the audience lining up to see I Love Lucy, and it says on the side of it there's a sign in the bracket still there that says the Desi Lou Playhouse, and it has the audience lining up to see this taping of I or this filming of I Love Lucy, and if you look really closely at this image of the audience uh, lining up on the side of the studio are actually a couple of um, lights outdoor land from the ceiling yeah. you know what i mean like mounted on the side yeah. of the building well one of those days when i was walking by it was hanging on a wire literally a single wire and i and i and i poked it and it magically floated down to oh the my ground. gosh and actually finders keepers <laughs> this is it <laughs> <laughs> So Fred Studios is looking for their old light. <laughs> it was, I mean, I'll just think, I look at these, these are broken wires. It was just they hanging there. Like fell to the ground. And, uh, Amazing. I feel, whatever, piece of glass, but, but this was, yeah, this shows up in that old picture, too. And I have a lot of uh-huh. loose stuff here from her last house, too. But anyway, we're going to get into all that. We'll get into but the house remember, in no, a bit, yeah. So they, they moved I Love Lucy to, after two years, to Red Studios, which is on Coenga. And then they took the profits of My Love Lucy and bought RKO Studios, and it became Desi Lou. And they also had an office over in Culver City near the Fox lot, too, or by the mm-hmm. uh, by MGM, I think. But, uh, but yeah, they were, they, I mean, they bought a studio. That's, that's, that's so cool. And now it's all yeah. belongs to Paramount, as right. does I Love Lucy and, right. uh, and all the other shows that they, Mission Impossible and... And and famously, uh, when they negotiated their deal, they got the replay rights to the show, which at the time the, the studios and networks did not realize had any value because there was no such thing as as 
uh, replays and, and uh, re-airs. And then a few years later, they realized they, <laughs> what they'd given them, and uh, they bought it back from them for a, a, a large pile of money. They got their rights back. But yeah, so they um, very wisely had the rerun rights for a time, back before there was such a thing as reruns. In fact, there's that famous moment in Back to the Future, remember? Where he's watching TV, where they're all watching TV. He's back in the fifties, and Marty says, "Oh, I think I saw this a rerun." And the and Dad looks, "What? What's a rerun?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's true, but they. I read that that they they weren't going to film it for posterity at at first, but they Lucy decided to keep it as like home movies. I don't know mm. if that necessarily true because they didn't have any kids at that point, but uh, right. that's what they say. So I, I, I they who are who are they? Right no, I don't know. But <laughs> so that was Desi Arnaz. Uh, rest in peace, Desi. And that leaves, um, you know, the the Lucy herself, Lucille Ball, uh, the great uh, comedian. And um, I watched a, uh, I watched an, an old episode of I Love Lucy in prep for this show. I watched one of the early early episodes uh, from the first season where um, Lucy is con- she's reading a tr- a crime book uh, and she's getting wrapped up in it, and then she becomes convinced that Desi is trying to kill her. Mm -hmm. And it is it's so it just reminds you of how funny the show is. There's a scene where (laughs) she's strapped pans to herself to keep him from being able to shoot her. (laughs) And they're in the room together. I think the kitchen together. And she's bobbing and weaving like a (laughs) like a boxer while they're talking. And he's kind of like, what are you doing? And she's she's so physically so funny in it and to, to watch it you know 60 some years later and it's still it's well i guess yeah 70 years later uh, now uh it's the 70th anniversary now of the year when the, the show premiered it's it's really it's hilarious it, it's it's great when comedy carries over and holds up like that and i love lucy is definitely one of those shows that holds up i think yeah yeah it's 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 the formula that they've used for uh probably for many many shows but uh, but yeah, and and Lucy herself, I mean, that was a character. Lucy, you know, Lucy Ball was not Lucy uh, in real life. But all every 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 part she played on every Lucy show, Life with Lucy, I Love Lucy, you know, it was always the Lucy character. But mm-hmm. it's far far from the real Lucy Ball, most definitely. But she was good at it. She was really good at it. And they compare like yeah. uh, Gilda Radner to her. Uh, they compare. Um, I'm trying to think of some other people that uh, they have that physical ability, physical comics, you know, it's. Uh... And, and to that point, she to that point, she was a fan of Three's Company. And one of her last one of the late things she filmed, you know, a few years before her death was a, a Three's Company kind of retrospective special that they did that she kind of hosted and walked fans through some of the best moments from Three's Company. And she reported it was a big fan of it. And you can see why. It was very, very similar to her, to her style of comedy that her show was, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. Wow. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Lucy yep. watched his company. <laughs> <laughs> I could see it, though. I mean, it's very it's it, her and Jack, I think, had a lot of uh, the Jack character had a lot in common. That physical comedy and constantly getting into jams. And, uh, yeah, I can totally see how she would have liked it. But she was, you know, she would always say, um, she'd say that she's not funny in real life. She, you know, she always said that. I'm funny on paper, mm. but mm. I, I am, uh, but, uh, you know, I, my part is to be that way. But, uh, you know, but I'm not funny in real life. Although she had an edge to her, definitely. <laughs> there was something that uh, I read. <clears throat> it, when when Lucy died, you know, this supposedly autobiography was locked away in in this closet and lucy arnaz her daughter found it and published it and Mm. uh, and um the story which which i took away from it which is something i've repeated many times and i may have even said it on on one of our podcasts but one of lucy's favorite things to do she said that uh that uh sometimes a there'd be a dinner party and after dinner they'd be standing around having cocktails and cigarettes and somebody would inevitably inevitably go and use the restroom (laughs) so on that person's return to the party Lucy, this person would be walking in, and Lucy would turn to the person to her left and say, well, there she is now. Tell her to her face. Uh, <laughs> so she definitely had an edge to her. Which, uh, which, uh, is that's hilarious. hilarious. 
But uh, uh, and and to, to kind of to that point, she also liked to say tell tell people that because uh, you know, I think she had some she was involved in some comedy classes and stuff like that, and she acting classes, and she said you you can't learn comedy; you either have it or you don't. And I think to a large extent that's true. You, you're either funny or you aren't. But and also, you know, comedy is a craft. Acting is a craft. Comedy writing is a craft. There's a lot of people out there who are funny but can't write comedy. They're funny to be around, but they can't do comedy. They can't do stand up. They can't write a, a hit comedy movie. You know what I mean? So it's it is. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't teach funny, um, but you can learn the craft if you are funny of developing that into being a, a professional comedian or, or comedic actor like she was um so that's that, yeah that's really interesting um so we, we've already kind of said a lot about her her career at least what she accomplished and all the other shows that she um produced and was re- responsible for and how successful she was as a business person um it is a little weird to watch her shows in the 60s that are in color <laughs> after, 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 after getting to know her so well in black and white and she, they relocated her character, well, the Lucy Carmichael character, to Hollywood. Thus, mm. it became like a parade of guest stars, you know. And it, right. it was like every episode there was somebody famous that would, you know, Joan Crawford was on one, and Tulula Bankhead was on one, and John Wayne was on one, and there was one, a very famous one, with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor, where you mm. know they, Elizabeth Taylor had this like some ridiculous like sixty five carat diamond ring and, uh, <laughs> and brought it like you know i think literally this can't this she could only take it out of the vault like once every five years to wear it i mean it was a real it was a real diamond and they used it on the show with richard burton and and uh, elizabeth taylor and and it, it fell off of no yeah it fell off she took it off to wash her hands elizabeth taylor and lucy put it on couldn't get it off and that was oh, the premise right. of the show so anyway, Richard Burton uh, writes this in his in his in his diaries, and I'm going to read this to you. And it's a real insight. Now Burton was a was a was an alcoholic, you know, and in a very pretentious and very opinionated. And they were at the top of the Liz and Dick fame thing too, you know. I mean, they were they were everyone was fascinated with these two people. So this is what he has to say about Lucy. Okay, now those who. Uh, Uh, Those who have told us that Lucille Ball was very wearing were not exaggerating. She is a monster of staggering charmlessness and monumental lack of humor. She is not wearing to us because I suppose we refuse to be worn. I am coldly sarcastic with her to the point of outright contempt, but she hears only what she wants to hear. Nineteen solid years of double takes and pratfalls, and despite upstaging and cutting other people's laughs if she can, nervously watching the ratings as she does so. A machine of enormous energy, which, driven by a stupid driver who has forgotten that a machine runs on oil as well as gasoline and who has neglected the former, is creaking badly towards a final convulsive seize-up. I loathed her that first day. I loathed her the second and the third. I loathe her today, but now I also pity her. After tonight, I shall make a point of never seeing her again. We work or have worked until today, which is the last, thank God, from 10 a.m. to somewhere around 5 p.m. And Milady Ball, Milady Balls can thank her lucky stars that I am not drinking. There's a chance that I might have killed her. Jack Benny, the most amiable man in the world, and one of the truly great comedians of our time, said that in four days she reduced his life expectancy by 10 years. The hitherto <laughs> impeccably professional Joan Crawford was so inhibited by his behemoth of selfishness that she got herself stupendously crocked for the entire show and virtually had to be helped to her feet and managed. Not without some satisfaction, I dare say, to bugger up the whole show. And uh, Joan Rivers was, or Joan Crawford supposedly said, you know, and they think I'm a bitch. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that is scathing and I'm sure, uh, you know, exaggerated considerably, but very eloquently, sure. well thought out. And, you know, in and, and one person's perspective, but it also is, um, you know, backed up by some would, you know, say facts. Uh, you sure. know, very gross, grossly... Uh, 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 you know, just yeah, you know, fascinating. I, I could not. I was like, my eyes were bugged out of my head reading that. Like, oh my god. I kind of wondered too, though. You know, crit- anytime there's criticism of someone like her from her era, how much sexism is it was involved in that? And would they think feel that way if it was a, a male, a man doing what she did? 
you yeah. know, blazing the trail. She had to be who she was in order to survive and the, the, do what she did, basically. And the fruits of that sh- are, sh- are self-evident, they sh- you know, what she accomplished. Yeah, so she, I can kind of see both sides of it. <laughs> she said that uh, women's lib, talk about women's lib. You know, she'd been doing this. She owned a studio, for God's sake. She yeah. owned these shows. Right. You know, right. women's lib, oh, I'm afraid it doesn't interest me one bit. I've been so liberated, it hurts. <laughs> it's like, yeah, hurry. So she had a, she knew what worked. She was proto, she was proto women's lib. <laughs> she was precursor to it, yeah. She knew what worked. And in any, in any capacity, except for the very last, uh, Life with Lucy, in every capacity, she succeeded in being that character, really. And, uh, and it, right. it treated her well. It treated her well. Um, so she passed away on April 26th, 1989 at 77. So she was the last of the main cast, um, to pass away. Uh, Desi had passed away three years earlier and, um, she was 77 and she died from an abdominal aortic aneurysm. She had had, uh, she'd been hospitalized, I believe for, for some heart problems leading up to that. Um, and then had been released and then. And then had severe, she woke up with severe back pain, which is one of the symptoms of abdominal aortic aneurysm and was died at the hospital or was declared dead at the hospital. Yeah. She, she was in the hospital for uh, about eight or nine days. She, she had, she had uh, uh, chest pains and they, 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 you know, a doctor came and said, go now. And within a couple hours, we right. were in the table for like eight hours. And uh, and um, and, they, and they gave her a, an aorta from a, 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 mo- a guy, a 27 year old uh, motorcycle accident uh, fatality is where she got it huh. from this this valve, and um, and she was recuperating. You know, she was up and she was walking around her hospital room and everything. And and of course, yeah. the world was mourning, not mourning, but worried. I remember Jerry's Deli was across the street uh, from Cedars, and her yep. room overlooked it. And they had a big sign, Get Well, Lucy, uh, uh, on, painted on the roof of that. And then uh, the Hard Rock Cafe, which was down on the corner, had a big sign, Get Well, Lucy. They had a, a scroll. I don't know what ever happened to this thing, but it was like an entire block of Hollywood Boulevard where people were signing Get Well Wishes to Lucy. I mean, it, it was a, you know, it was she's a big deal. And uh, and um, but anyway, she she ended up collapsing at the hospital and died suddenly. So that you know that was yeah. that, that was a surprise. They all, she was on the mend, and uh, and everyone thought she'd be out in no time. But uh, no time happened rather quickly, and uh, and, and that's when she passed. And away. I think the, and I think doctors claim that her her aneurysm that she died her aortic aneurysm she had was unrelated to the surgery. I don't know if that's I don't know if, if that's true or not. But it was days apart, so I don't know. <laughs> A life of time of smoking non-filter cigarettes um, yep. didn't hurt either. You know, it, it, <laughs> it's nice though that all those nice outpouring of support happened because supposedly she was a bit bitter, kind of in the last years of her life, and it didn't help that you know Desi died in '86, and I think that was the same year she attempted a comeback show that got canceled after a couple of months. So she had she got hit pretty hard, pretty brutal. Yeah, that show was terrible, and yeah, yeah she <laughs> didn't recuperate from that one. Life with Lucy was was just horrendous and it was a real shame it's a real shame but she yeah, was yeah. you know she was in you know she was in her upper 70s at that point and she just the television yeah. moved on and she was still yeah. being that character she was still portraying that character we've mentioned this before uh, on the show once or twice but her, her last public appearance was at the academy awards with bob hope uh just about four weeks before she passed away um they came out and i think presented an award together or something introduced something yeah it was uh, yeah, and she looked great. She really, I mean, you know, a lifetime of smoking was clear, but uh, but right. she had to dress, and it was cut up to her, you know, to her her thigh, and she looked amazing. Yeah. And uh, and it was a nice way to go out, being uh, you know, being greeted that uh, that lovingly by the audience with Bob Hope, and uh, yeah. So, yeah. But I don't think it's kind of like it's kind of like Chaplin, kind of like Chaplin coming back toward the end of his life at the Academy Awards and getting the standing ovation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But she was. Yeah. So she was uh, she was cremated and uh, she was placed in a niche with her mother at Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills in the Columbarium of Radiant Dawn. <laughs> and I know that off the top of my head. I'm not reading that. <laughs> so I used to go there all the time. <laughs> and then, uh, but then her kids bid for her house in Jamestown, New York, where she grew up, on eBay. I guess the house was on eBay, 
and they bought it with an, you know some sort of investors and now there's a Lucy Museum in Jamestown so against her mother's wishes uh, their mother's wishes they had Lucy and her mother exhumed from Forest Lawn the place where they chose to be to now she's a tourist attraction in Jamestown, Jamestown New York uh, which you know that's just it's just the way it is. But um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Lucy, Lucy herself chose where she, her final resting place would be, and uh, and uh, it was not to be. But you know, her her supposedly. Now, oh, I found another, there was another story that I that I heard about Lucy. Um, you know, Kate. Kate you know who Kay Ballard was. Um, well, that was, sounds very familiar. She was the star of the Mothers in Law, that show that Desi produced, and she was an old. You know, old pro comic stand up stuff. She was an amazing singer, and she's a she's a lesbian. I mean, Lucy hung around with a lot, a lot of lesbians, and uh, and uh, but Kay Ballard was was you know very. I, I, there's a relevance to that, and I don't know what it is. My bringing out that she was gay, but <laughs> anyway, Kay Ballard and Lucy were close friends, and this is a story that the Kay Ballard tells. She said, uh, Lucy and I in Palm Springs, Lucy and I were riding bikes when a dog came out of the woods, foaming at the mouth. She just looked at the dog and screamed, get the f out of here, and the dog ran back into the woods. <laughs> Kay Ballard says, I turned to her and, and said, that is why you are queen of the world and I am nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Lucy, Lucy lived uh, at the same house for till, the, till she died. They bought the house in the, in the 50s. Uh, on Roxbury Drive, uh, 1000 Roxbury Drive, and she lived there until the day she died. Um, yep. Although she didn't die in the house, she lived there until the day she died. Same house she shared with Desi, same house she brought up her kids, and the same house she shared with Gary Morton. Gary. Um, so there's a number, this happens a lot. There's a number of, uh, if you scroll through the IMDb for I, I Love Lucy, there's, and this, I, you, you see this a lot with other shows that were long running. Um, there's certain actors who, uh, you've never heard of but who appear in a bunch of episodes always as kind of a different character right they bring back the same person guy or girl uh to play various extra parts really or featured extra sometimes they have a line sometimes they don't and there uh the one that stood out to me was an actor named bennett green and he was actually desi's stand-in uh on the show and uh i've seen this before and stuff i've worked on where uh, the stand-in he's the stand-in is there on say on set every day anyways so if you need an extra you need you need somebody to play a messenger at the door or whatever or a party guest why not grab them they're standing there anyways so bennett green ended up appearing in 15 episodes but always as somebody different he was a messenger he was a delivery man he was a camera operator he was a dock worker florist hot dog vendor <laughs> party guest neighbor man on the street stage hand in the audience etc um and then um he also went on to appear in eight episodes and similar supporting parts on the Lucy show in the 60s, which is kind of interesting since Desi wasn't around for that. Uh, he, so he wasn't he the stand-in anymore, but they obviously you know, must have formed some type of a relationship with him and kept bringing him back. Uh, Bennett Green passed away on September 8th, 1982. He was 77, and he is also at Hollywood Forever. Hmm which is cool. Um, Aaron Spelling, uh, there's a bunch of you scroll. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of actors and actresses credited on the IMDb. So there's probably a bunch of cool ones I've missed, but uh, Aaron Spelling played a gas station man on an episode. So you must've been one of those little bit parts. And um, there were also a bunch of uh, celebrity guests who appeared as themselves on I love Lucy. Um, the most famous one I think is William Holden. And that my one of my most famous scenes from the whole show, when they go to Hollywood and she has she's at the Brown Derby and William, Brown Derby right or yeah is the Brown Derby there yeah and William Holden is there and she has this hilarious encounter with him you know him playing himself uh, John Wayne was also in it Orson Welles Bob Hope Rock Hudson, Rock Hudson uh, Van Johnson and Hedda Hopper all appeared as themselves and there's probably more that I've missed but I thought that was kind of interesting um, it's, it's a lot of celebrity guest appearances when they went to Hollywood, um, you know, because I'm, I'm a little bit of a, well, everyone is that lives in L.A., uh, you know, you look in the background constantly for stuff you recognize. Yeah, because it's almost like a documentary to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. There's that scene where they first get to Hollywood and they pull into a hotel, and that hotel's the Avalon on Wilshire. 
uh, oh, right there, on. But it's, you know, I love uh, that hotel. Near yeah. Century City, but you, you know, it's got that kind of uh, mid-century kind of breeze block great. exterior, and you yeah. see them going right into there. Now, when they show the sets, when they're, um, you know, they're on the set, they're in their room, their hotel room. The view outside the window was a photograph taken from the roof of the studio where they made it. Because you could see the Hollywood sign, you could see the Plaza Hotel, you could see the Broadway. All those signs right. are still there, and uh, but it was so, so they basically went on the roof and took of a course. and blew it up and, uh, <laughs> right. and made it to the exterior of their hotel, which is kind of a, a clever idea. Well, easy. I want to say clever, right. it's easy. Right. So, uh, Just but I do love the photographer up there and stuff. do it. So, <laughs> the Harpo Marx thing was great. Um, mm. There was there were some really great. I love the Hollywood episodes. They're my favorites, most definitely. So let's talk about ghosts, shall we? Um, you mentioned you mentioned her house in Beverly Hills, on uh, which is at a thousand North Roxbury Drive. Uh, unfortunately, it was um, a few years after she passed away. Gary Morton uh, sold it, and uh, somewhere at some point, the new owners heavily renovated it, um, which is really too bad. So it still somewhat, you know, resembles the original house, but it's kind of been plastered, and part of it was torn down. And it's just, it's a bummer. It's a bummer. It's always a bummer when these houses get, especially one that someone lived in it for a long time, like she did. Like it's a bummer that people don't respect the history and leave them alone, but. Um, there's lots of stories that she haunts the house. Uh, and some of the ones I found, uh, there's the reports of broken windows and a lot of activity in the attic. Um, loud voices coming from the attic, um, furniture in the house getting moved around, but also boxes in the attic getting moved around. Uh, people have heard the sounds of a party upstairs before. Um, people have heard the I Love Lucy theme song coming from the <laughs> attic. And th these are the current owners, you know, that are claiming, or, or past owners. I don't know if, who owns it now. Um, and there's a blog called Seeks Ghosts um, that says, uh, that I think originated this story, uh, that a friend of Lucille's drove past the property to see the home one last time. Walls were missing. He was in being renovated. He could see Lucille's old bedroom. And then he noticed a tall, slim redhead peering through the fence at what was left. And she turned toward him and realized it was Lucy. And she looked upset and confused. And then she walked around the south corner of the house and disappeared. Wow. Interesting. Well, that's, I, I, I've never heard any of these stories. That's really interesting. Um, the, the attic is where she used to tie up and beat the kids. Oh, nice. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, if we got like a mommy dearest thing going on here. <laughs> um, um, uh, I've heard, I've heard these stories before and, uh, and it seems to come from multiple sources. So it is interesting. And, and I mean, among people that are into paranormal investigating and stuff that it is the, um, the less traveled places and buildings are where they say where, you know, the ghosts like to hang out basically and not be bothered. So that's attics, yeah. crawl spaces, basements, storage areas, closets, whatever, secret rooms behind doors, whatever is where they hang out. So it's interesting that the, a lot of the stuff seems focused on the attic of the house. Um, and then uh, there's also claims that she haunts the old studio building, which is now at Paramount. I've heard that one. Yeah, I've heard that yeah. one. Or no, the and old. You, uh, I know it was. Re it was the one in Los Palmas. Was I was, was I heard that too? I'm not saying she didn't okay. haunt Paramount, but I right. heard it was the one on uh, on Los Palmas uh, where they uh -huh. filmed the last the first two years uh, of of the show. I've heard that, but uh -huh. um, yeah. So she, yeah, she good for her. <laughs> um, and then she also uh, they had a ranch house in uh, in the valley in, in Chatsworth called Desilu Ranch. Um, unfortunately, it was it was demolished in the mid seventies for a, a subdivision that was built there. So kind of a bummer, but it was up on Devonshire, uh, so pretty far north. And then um, she all, they also had a place in Palm Springs. Yes, I knew about that one too. You know, something um, happened, which I don't know what this. I want to go back to the house in a second. But when yeah, she yeah. died, they had uh, a few. They had three funerals for her. One was a private family, a private one in uh, Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. it was funny because Gary Morton was put, was quoted in the uh, in the uh, in what I don't know what magazine or newspaper and says, you know, it's going to be a private thing. We got a guy around here that shows where people died, and none of us want anything like that. Talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of funny, but uh, but uh, when um, 
So they had these three funerals, one in Los Angeles, one in New York, one in Chicago. I was living in Chicago at the time, so I went to the Chicago one. And I can't explain what happened. This is the weirdest thing, and I don't know if this is paranormal. It's probably <laughs> something ridiculous, and it didn't happen in, in, the, in the cathedral either. But I was on my way. We took a taxi from the office to the funeral. And this never happened to me before or since, but I was in the taxi. We are talking about Lucy, and I looked up, and it was at that very moment there were, like, water in my eyes both my eyes dripping water directly into my eyes there was nothing there there was no one near me that to do that there was nothing in the taxi but it was just the weirdest i can't explain it <laughs> i just always attributed it to lucy because it happened right then but i just so it was weird i've never heard of that oh. from anyone else either but you know my eyes are fine now they're you know old and decrepit but uh <laughs> but but then you know it was just the weirdest thing i looked up and boom these these drops of waters were in my eye it was just the weirdest you thing. were you were in the taxi yeah it was in the back of a taxi so, so like like it came out of the ceiling of the car nothing, there was nothing oh, there weird. nothing right. nothing was there i was talking to the person next to me and i said what you know and there was like nothing <laughs> I, I can't explain it, so I can't say it's You're super. Like, I'm going to say that was the, one of the weirdest things that it's I can't. Like you turn, it's like you turned into one of those uh, those Catholic statues that cry. Maybe so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to get next. <laughs> but that, it was just weird. I can't. Um, I can't figure out what that was. But anyway. So uh, so yeah, and L- Lucy. So I don't I really know the logistics of that house. The house was empty for probably six years, sitting there on that corner, and it was just falling apart. I mean, people, you know, no Damn. one was living in it, and all of Lucy's things were still in it. And uh, somebody I knew worked at um, uh, it was it Universal, and I don't know what the I don't know how these you know ownership of what ended up where. I know that the Lucy show was made at Universal. I don't know who you know who actually owned it. But my friend, I think, worked for Universal, was documenting everything that was in the house. And, you know, we just got to look, you know, Lucy kept some of her costumes there, too, which was kind of cool. So, and also that Lucy Museum was at Universal Studios for a while, down where, you know, down in the the, uh, un, the lower section of Universal Studios. So Universal must own something uh, with uh, of Lucy, or at least used to. And uh, so so this house sat there empty for years, and it was literally falling apart. I mean, like the shutters, which I, I don't know, they're in a box somewhere. I have some of her shutters uh, that were just, you know, just falling literally apart. Uh, uh, we were able to get into the house, actually, at one point. And uh, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it was empty at that point, and the walls were falling down, and, and we got, right. like, my friend got her welcome mat. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, but so that'd be so, amazing. I would love to have that. Yeah, and it has one of the vents, which is all you know, all yellow and nicotined, and you know, because yeah. it hadn't been it hadn't been redone in a very very long time. Yeah. So it cut to about a year ago. Uh, I get this this email out of nowhere from a guy who says, "I have Lucy's sink. Do you want it?" And I'm like, <laughs> "It was a hair sink." And he goes, "I have this. Do you want it?" And and I'm like from her house on Roxbury. I'm like, yeah. So within, uh, you know, half an hour, I was at the guy's house and he, you know, you can't, you know, this is a between us thing. I mean, I could talk about it. Obviously he gave it to me because he knows what I do and right. uh, I, I couldn't divulge who he is, but he gave me the sink that Lucy had in her house that she would have her hair dyed every week. Or- so it had like the little, the little scoop out of it for you to put your head like in a hairdresser studio. Please. Yeah, yes. I, yeah. Get it. I get it. So, so, so I have, and then he gave me this envelope and it are two of Lucy's credit cards, you know, gas what? station cards and stuff like that to Lucille Ball. And he's like, here, you can have these. Cause you know, I'm not going to do anything with them. At least if you have them, someone will have someone will be able yeah. to see. So, That's cool. and, you know, so, so I have Karen Carpenter's sink and now I have Lucy's sink. And then there was a guy who's probably still selling it on eBay, uh, little vials of the hair dye that she, mm. she used to use. It was a particular Egyptian type of hair dye that henna that she would use. And there was, I remember. Because she was not a natural redhead. She had brown hair, I believe, naturally, right? Yeah, she wasn't a redhead. Yeah. But right. the, but the, it was only a particular shade of red and only a particular type of dye that she would use. Mm. And, um, so then, uh, you know, upon little searching, I found a, 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 an appearance that she did on the, Dyn- I think it was Dinah Shore show. And her and Vivian Vance were on this show together. And this is in the 70s. And they tell a story about 
being in Lucy's house and they're getting their hair done. And this is cool because I have the sink now, you know, it's sitting in my driveway right now. But, um, but I, and she says, Vivian Vance starts the story. And it, now keep in mind, this is the six, this is the seventies. And, and if you watch the Dean Martin celebrity graphs, it's very unpolitically correct. I mean, mm. to the point where it's like people would be, you know, protesting and demanding death if they were to watch <laughs> these shows. And, and to right. be, I'm dead serious. They are so, yeah out there anyway so so but this is you know it's a good natured show and and it's good natured vivian vance is saying you know lucy and i she was getting i was getting my hair dyed peroxided and lucy was getting her henna and and we've got you know our toes up we're getting pedicures and and uh, we're sitting in lucy's house and the next thing you know this group of people walk through the house and they're they're dressed up and they've got these amazing clothes on and 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 they're clearly well it was the you know lucy said they're from india or or no siam i guess at that point mm. and then she yeah. goes and they're wearing these clothes and then the women had the dot the whole thing you know <laughs> yeah. walking through their house so they're walking literally like a tour bus dropped them off and they're walking through lucy's house and they're walking through you know this beauty room where they're <laughs> giving their hair styled and she and then vivian Bian says and we found out later it was the king of Siam. <laughs> so just walking through Lucy's <laughs> house as they got their blocks. But it was just it was it was fascinating uh, to hear this story and now you know having a piece of it is kind of cool too. But uh, cool. but yeah, it's just it's a it's a different time and there's a lot of things wrong with that time, uh, certainly. But uh, yeah. but there's not there's not um, you know Lucy was her own mold that she broke. I mean she. Yep. She she was she was everything, you know, she was the whole deal. Uh business person, successful actress, uh mother, you know. Uh, yep. uh, and even, even the daughter Lucy Arnaz said, you know, when you're when you're the daughter of two beyond the realm of comprehension famous people. Right. <laughs> and, right. Uh, and uh and and it's true, that had to have been very difficult. And now there's all that uproar about not uproar, but they're making the new biopic. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, with the, I guess they've already cast Nicole Kidman as Lucy and, uh, mm -hmm. Desi Arnaz, but I, I watched a little Instagram thing that she did and she goes, this isn't, you know, they're not being Lucy and Ricky, like, you know, them. they're being my parents and, uh, it's right. not, a, not a hack job. This is a real story and you're going to get a real look at the way things were. We're not casting right. the I love Lucy. We're casting them as human right. beings. Right. And uh, right. so it's it's going to be it's going to be an interesting project. I'm looking forward. Yeah, to it. I think but if it's who, anything like who, Nicole was it was Kate. What be wished it sucked. <laughs> you know. Uh, so originally, Kate Blanchett was supposed to play Lucy in this in this show, and for whatever reason, that changed, and uh, and they they it's now going to be um, Nicole Kidman. So people were I think were bummed because Kate Blanchett is a is fantastic. She's such a fantastic actor, but so is Nicole Kidman. So uh, you know they they get the benefit of the doubt from me. I hope it I hope it's good. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Did, did you read? Well, you must have. It was big, kind of one of those entertainment funny stories. But they had the Jamestown, you know, museum, uh, Lucy's hometown, in her old house where she grew up, and that's where Lucy's now buried. But a couple of years ago, there was it was kind of a scandal because they had the most hideous Lucy statue there. Did you, did you <laughs> I remember that. Yes. yes oh my god! That. It was it so bad. Horrifying. And uh, and it was commissioned and approved because they put it in a park somewhere. And for some reason, it I became... just it, weren't the eyes and the and the smile just like crazy. Wasn't that the one where the face was just like it would haunt your dreams? And like it was going to yeah. run at you and chew your face off. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so I don't know. Like I said, it was approved by somebody and it was put there. And they must have had some sort of ceremony. And they probably unveiled it. And were like. Yeah. Uh, but that cost a lot of yeah. money. We're just going to leave it. But they ended up replacing it. And I don't know what happened to the original Ugly Lucy, but if anyone has it and doesn't want it anymore, <laughs> I will be happy to take it. I yes. would love Ugly Lucy. <laughs> I think that would be... I would have it in front of my museum, my next museum. Oh, my God, I would so have the Ugly <laughs> Lucy in front of it. Oh, yes. yeah, most definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. Is that it? 
I think so. I mean, the other we characters do that we talked about briefly, you know, Gail Gordon, who played Mr. Mooney, and he followed her for her incarnations of, of the last Lucy shows, uh, uh, ended up being, you know, she was, he was married uh, for 57 years, died of cancer. Uh, Keith Thibodeau is still alive. He played little Ricky. Elizabeth Patterson, who played... Um, uh, Mrs. Trumbull, the neighbor upstairs, she died actually in the in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. She's one of the mm. I think three people that actually died in the hotel that are famous. I mean, people die in hotels right. all the time. So, and Mary Jane Croft uh, w- was also uh, one of her co-stars in in later the Lucy Show, I think, and she died in 1999, 83, in Century Park, uh, Century City. And I don't know. I think the the last story um, I I like is it's it's not a nice story, but we know that uh, Vivian Vance and William Frawley uh, they didn't care for each other very much. Right. And according to rumor, uh, Lou, Vivian Vance was on set for some show when she got the news that Frawley died, and she and her mm. words her reaction was champagne for everyone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well um with that champagne for everyone <laughs> to our uh our listeners <laughs> um and uh and also if uh we mention patreon uh we do have a patreon page and uh, patreon supporters all get early ac- or the five dollar a month ones get early access uh to the episodes and then everybody who subscribes to patreon uh gets um our extra mini shows that we do uh, between these main ones so uh hustle on over to patreon and look up dearly departed podcast uh and and you know we appreciate all the support to everyone who uh keeps uh backing us up and and supporting the show it, it really mean, means a lot and it, it helps it does and, and yeah and thank you very much uh for doing so and uh, and if you don't mind mike i'm going to give my my youtube channel a plug yes because um, of course that's there is no more tour, so that's how I'm making a living. But yeah. uh, and this and this, I mean, no, I'm, uh, this and that are, are my sure. job now. But uh, <laughs> recently, I you know, Dean Martin's house um, here in Palm Springs is abandoned, and I did a good walk around of that the other day, and I put that up on YouTube. When I did the episode of Ghost uh, Adventures, I did a lot of uh, footage of the Cecil. I uploaded that to my YouTube channel. And uh, so that, that's what I'm, I've been working on. And it's some, you know, some unusual things that I don't think a lot of people have seen. So, uh, so that is. And you did, uh, you, when Don Wells passed away this past, uh, a few weeks ago, you put up, uh, you, you opened up what you had got at her um, garage sale, which you had even forgotten what you had gotten. So you kind yeah, of did a, re- yeah. a box open reveal of it, of it which is cool. <laughs> well, how many the, subscribers the, are you up to now? I was like 60, 65,000, I think. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's I've been I've been lucky because I, people like what I do, so I'm I'm very right. and I love it now because I, I guess like without the business and I miss through Dilly Departed tours, uh, but I sure don't miss the hassles. I don't miss I don't miss the physical hassles of dealing with traffic, of dealing with insurance and insurance and insurance and you know it just the mechanics on the van and uh, all that it stuff. was so I mean yeah. I can't tell you how relieved it is right now to have this time to not have to have that hanging over my head all the time and i miss it god i do miss it but i wouldn't mind you know but I, it's just everything else was not fun uh so there's a 10 20 percent fun and the rest of it was like aggravating so now it's kind of cool i can do what i do do what i want and uh and i like it and people you know watch my youtube it's free it's free yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's a uh, dearly departed tours Is there dearly departed YouTube? online that's it yeah, on YouTube. Um, and what what did you find again in Don Wells that you got from Don Wells's since we mentioned it from her g- garage sale? Well, I found a I, had, I bought a jacket. Mm-hmm. I bought oh her eyelashes. That's what it was. Her uh, I found, oh okay. She had a vitamin container. You know, you get like the long containers Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sure. Friday, and every day had a pair of eyelashes in them. What? <laughs> Which is pretty funny. And uh, so a prescription for, I forget what it was. And um, I don't know. I, I, you know, it's so funny. It's just the other day. But it was, I had a ton of stuff. I did. Um, but it was all, I, and I like the real, oh, wigs. Oh, my God, I got so many wigs. Oh, and go-go boots. I got white go-go Mary boots. Ann, Mary Ann wore wigs? Yeah, I know. Wow. I know. But, uh, like, but, and they're all labeled, you know. 
fall, oh. good one, uh, you know, kind of thing. But That's the gu- hilarious. My, my favorite episode of Gilligan's Island, where the girls are singing, they're in a group called the Honeybees. And uh, <laughs> and I got this pair of white go-go boots. Now, I looked at them pretty closely, and I don't think they're the same ones. But people mm-hmm. who watch that video claim they, they, they think that those are the real ones that she used for the show. I can't. Uh, but that would be pretty cool. And I don't know how to prove that. But um, but they're pretty. Marianne's go-go boots. Anyway, you know, just. Yeah, even, it's cool. Not, but how many pairs of go-go boots can Marianne have? You know, yeah, how many white go-go boots did, did she own? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so so I don't know. If, you, if there anyone out there can, I, you know, identify stuff like that. And, and I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. If you had to see a screen worn costume from Gilligan's Island that, from you know, Marianne, that'd be pretty cool. Go-go boots. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Well, thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Very much. Appreciate it. Um, And a, a toast of champagne to you all. And we will see you on the next one.